Hello and good morning to everybody. Hope you are having a great morning. Let's uh, let's pray and um, we're going to spend some time in Matthew 16 today talking a little bit about the rock. And uh, should be good. Then we're so let's uh, let's pray. We're going to worship and then we're going to come back in in the word. Father in Jesus name, I thank you for today. I thank you for this opportunity to read your word. And I thank you for revelation. And I pray that every person who reads these words in your scripture, as we read them today, would have a revelation and a deeper and closer relationship with you. I love you. We thank you for this time. And we worship you now. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, let's uh, worship and then we'll come right back.
Father, I thank you again for this time to study your scriptures. And I ask that you would, Holy Spirit, shine your light on the things that are most important and that would help us to have a greater understanding of you. Reveal yourself to us, God, and allow us to understand your words and to be better after having read them. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. After have read them. I'm not sure that's the right way to say it, but I think God understands what we mean, right? All right. Uh, Matthew 16, 13. Let's read through this, and we're going to jump right in this morning. Today's message is kind of, uh, kind of interesting. It's almost... Um, fun facts about the scriptures that we're reading with a couple of personal highlights, I guess, but uh, just some background and some, some neat things and some things for us to be inspired by. Here we go. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, who do you, or who do people say that the son of man is? Who do people say I am? And they said, some say that John the Baptist, others say Elijah, still others Jeremiah, and one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father who is in heaven I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Then he warned the disciples that they should tell no one that he was the Christ. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and being raised up on the third day. Now, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. Whew. There's a rebuke, if I've ever heard one, right? All right, so let's jump into this roller coaster ride that Peter went down and uh, also get some uh, interesting things. Now, first of all, I want to talk quickly about so we're going to kind of follow Peter's interactions here, right? Because he goes from an extreme high to an extreme low and everything be in between. Um, but I want to just talk through this a little bit. So first of all, let's talk about this background, this confession of Caesarea uh, or Caesarea. I don't know. Caesarea. I've always said Caesarea Philippi. But now we have to understand this town that they're in. Okay. They've now traveled to Caesarea Philippi. They've kind of gotten alone. They're, Jesus is talking to them about all these things that are about to happen. Now, you got to understand again the, the backdrop here of this town and this city. So this city was once a center for Baal worship. Baal worship is some of the worst idolatrous worship of this false god. And they had some pretty awful practices of sacrifices and things like that. Now, there were at least 14 temples of Baal in this area. Believe, um, it's believed also to have in its borders the cavern in which the Greek god of nature was born. The Greek god of nature is Pan. In the beginning, it was so identified uh, with this god that it was named, or lowercase g god, that it was named after it being called Panius. One of the most amazing structures built in this city was this marble building built for the worship of Caesar. Herod the Great built the temple in honor of Caesar when Caesar bestowed on him another country. 
Now it was Herod's son, Philip, who adorned the temple with its magnificence that was ultimately known worldwide. And then Philip eventually changed the name of the city from Panius to Caesarea, or Caesar's town, and he added his name to the end of it. I guess that's the benefit of naming your own city. And so therefore it was called Caesar's town by Philip, or Caesarea Philippi. Now, our passage today takes place here in this city this place that was known for the worship of Caesar, Pan, Baal, and the gods, lowercase g, of your choice. Now, the Bible tells us that anyone who worships a god that's not the real god is actually worshiping demons. So, there you go. But, they, didn't, they worshiped Caesar, Pan, Baal, the gods of your choice, except the true god, our god. Now, it's in this setting, against this backdrop, that Jesus says, Who do you say that I am? It's in this place that Peter says, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. What an incredible revelation in a place known for all these idols and false gods. Also, side note, have you ever thought about the fact that the first confession and acknowledgement was by a man named Peter in a place that was called Pan? Just a thought. Anyway, Peter Pan. So Jesus says to them, who do you say that I am? As we stand in the midst of this place where there are all these false gods being worshipped and the names of the city goes from Pan to Caesar to the, from Baal to Pan to Caesar, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you're the Christ. You're the son of the living God, the one true God. Now, before he answers, asks them that, he says this. He says, who do men say that I am? And so they said, well, some say that you're John the Baptist. Matthew 14, 1 says, at the time Herod, the Tetrarch, heard the news about Jesus, he said to his servants, this is John the Baptist. He is risen from the dead, and that is why miraculous powers are at work in him. So there was this common thought from Herod and probably from many others that this was John the Baptist raised from the dead now out doing these miraculous works, right? And so they thought that he was this ambassador for righteousness or a spirit of righteousness like John the Baptist, that he had come to tell people to repent of their sins and stop sinning, be righteous, live right. John proclaimed the coming of the king and the kingdom. So they figured Jesus was doing the same thing, proclaiming this coming of a kingdom, proclaiming this need to repent, for the kingdom of God was near. Also, some of them believed that he was Elijah. Now, Elijah was considered the greatest prophet of all time. He was predicted to be a forerunner of the coming of Messiah. Malachi 4, 5. Behold, I am going to send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. So even today, many Jewish people expect Elijah to come as a forerunner to the Messiah. Those who don't believe Jesus is the Messiah. Um, I read somewhere that even... In a Passover feast, they'll leave a chair empty and open for Elijah. So, some thought he's Elijah. He's the prophet. Now, Jeremiah, some of them thought that he was, is who he was. 
that he was gonna it was it was thought at the time that Jeremiah would return to the earth right before the Messiah showed up. They thought that he would bring with him the tabernacle, the ark, and the altar of incense. And it's said that he took them and he hid them in the Mount Nebo right before he died, and, and that's according to some other writings, like in the Maccabees. And then others said he's a prophet. Some believe that he was just this great man or this prophet sent by God. Um, now, we talked about that a little bit, I think, last week or the week before, that Jesus either is who he said he is, or he's a fraud and a liar, but he can't be a great man somewhere in between because he either deceived the whole world or he told the truth and he saved the whole world. And so some said, hell, oh, he's, a, he's a prophet. He's just a, a good man, another good man. But Peter, standing in the midst of everything around him, looked at Jesus and said, I know who you are. You're the Christ. You're the Messiah. You're the Son of God. Peter got this revelation. Jesus says, who do you say that I am? I was talking to someone recently. Um, leaving, I was leaving the baseball field and uh, ran across a couple of my friends. And we got to talking about church league softball and stuff. And, you know, they asked me, what church do you go to? And I asked them, well, what church do you go to? And, I got to thinking about that. That is such a common question that we ask. What church do you go to? What church are you part of? And my response to them was, um, you know, I, I got to thinking about it. And, I, and then I, I was kind of thinking, you know, at the end of the day, I don't know if that's the right question to ask. But a lot of, I, mean, I think so often we identify with or affiliate our Christianity with the church that we attend. And I get it. I mean, we're part of this community and that that's important, but it's funny because when you talk to somebody and you say, are you a Christian? Well, I attend this church. And so you almost, there's almost this like identity or, um, kind of this, uh, chemistry that, that goes along with that when you say, oh, I attend this church, or I attend this church, almost immediately, a lot of times, especially if you know about that church, people will think some sort of label on that church, right? And I get it. There's communities within, I mean, in Revelation, there's multiple churches that Jesus is talking to. Each of them has strengths. Each of them has issues. And so there's going to be these different, and there was 12 tribes. Each of the tribes had different characteristics. I get it. All of that stuff is there. But at the center of it all is not it's not necessarily so important to say what church do you go to and this is what we were talking about the softball guys and i at the end of the day it's who do you say jesus is if jesus asks us who do you say i am well who is he to us It's way more important of a question than what church do you attend? Have we stopped to think for a minute? Who is Jesus to me? Peter, in the moment, goes, you're the Christ. You're the Son of God. Think about that for a minute. A man in the flesh, standing in front of him, and he's going, you were actually born from God. Two thousand years ago, a man walked on the earth. He lived a perfect life. He served the masses, healed many, taught in un incredible ways, and changed the world forever. Then he died on a cross to take our sin away. Who do you say that he is? The answer to this question determines your life and it determines your salvation. 
Matthew 10, 32 says, Therefore, everyone who confesses me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth Jesus as your Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with your heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness. And with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. We must have total conviction that he is the Son of God. Our faith totally placed in him. He is the seed of God the Father, and therefore sinless at birth, lived a sinless life, is the only one capable of taking our place because he is due no punishment of his own. Just like one man, Adam, passed sin on to many, one man, Jesus, passed salvation on to many. Those who would believe in him and confess him. Upon this rock, that confession, I will build my church, Jesus says. Peter says, you're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon Peter. Man didn't reveal this to you. God did. Upon this rock, I will build my church. Let's talk about that for a second. What, what rock? Well, Peter and his confession. Peter confesses Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God, the Messiah. Peter was there to open the door of the church to the Jews and the Gentiles. In 1 Corinthians 3.11, it says, No man can lay a foundation other than that one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Okay? So he lays the foundation, and he is the cornerstone. 1 Peter 2.4, Coming to him as to a living stone, which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God, Okay, so coming to him, who? Jesus. As to a living stone. So he is a living stone which has been rejected by people, but is choice and precious in the sight of God. You also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So no longer are we a physical house, we are a stone. Each individual is a stone in a spiritual house, and each individual is offering spiritual sacrifices. We're no longer slaughtering lambs, we're offering spiritual sacrifices to God through Jesus Christ. So Peter opens the door, and I'm talking about this because Jesus is the rock, the, the foundation. But then we are also each stones and rocks being placed upon the cornerstone, Jesus. Peter opened the door, Acts 2.41, at Pentecost when he preached the gospel and thousands were saved. Okay, Peter preaches to the Jewish people about who Jesus is and what's happened and thousands get saved. But then again in Acts 10, when God tells Peter in this vision that he has while he's sitting on the roof to go and kill and eat animals that had traditionally been unclean to Jewish people. And God says, don't call what I call clean, unclean. There, in other words, he's saying, there is now new, there is a, a uh, because of what Jesus has done, there is no longer this unclean separation. And he's talking about Jews and Gentiles, anyone who's non, not a Jewish person. And so he says, and so in Acts 10, we see Peter going to, a home of Gentiles and Gentiles being saved and receiving the Holy Spirit. So Peter is there 
to, in, to open the door to the Jewish people and to the Gentile people for salvation. And upon this rock, his church is being built because he proclaimed the good news. Just like we all can. So the rock is Peter's profession or, or confession of Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God, believing in his heart, confessing with his mouth, understanding salvation that he is born again, and then upon his, that rock his church will be built. Then proclaiming that truth, that good news, to Jew and Gentile alike so that many are saved. Now, here's the interesting thing about Peter, because he professes this, and, and Jesus is like, yes. At the end of our baseball games in Little League, we give out a game ball to the kid who does something good during the game. Um, Peter gets the game ball for that one, right? But then what happens? Right afterwards, he gets rebuked. And Peter kind of seems to go through these things all the time, right? Like... He walks on water, and then moments later, his, he takes his eyes off Jesus, and his faith kind of like shrinks back, and he starts to sink. He says to Jesus, I'll never betray you, and then he denies him three times when Jesus gets arrested. And then here's Peter, he's just proclaimed, you are the Christ. And the next thing you know, Jesus rebukes him and says, get behind me, Satan. He says, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Yikes. Peter goes from the champion on top of the world to get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. Now remember, what did Satan do? He tried to tempt Jesus away from his God-given destiny. Satan wanted to mess up the plan of God. And so here, Peter is aligning himself more with Satan's plan than he is. And, and what does that do? Places a stumbling block in front of him, Jesus says. We know that Jesus agonized over his mission, that he sweat blood praying prior to going and being arrested and going to the cross, knowing that he was going to suffer the weight and the agony of becoming the sin of humanity so that we could have his righteousness. And he agonized over that. And Peter says to him, you don't have to do this, Jesus. God forbid it. It'll never happen to you. And Jesus is like, Peter, you're, a, you're, you're being a stumbling block to me. Don't make it easier for me to fulfill man's plans instead of God's plans. He says, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. I know Peter wanted to help him, but Peter was only thinking about worldly things. Jesus was thinking about eternal things. Jesus says, you got to set your mind on God's interests. How does Peter go from champion to rebuked? Because he set his mind on man's interests and not God's. What a lesson we can learn from that. We're to always be mindful of God's interests. And if Peter is susceptible to being a spokesperson of the enemy, then we are too. And if it can happen that quickly, then we have to always be on guard. We must always be mindful of God's interests. We must not lose sight of God's plans for us. When it comes to our career, our passions, our security, the things of the world. When Peter's focus became his own desire and his own plan, Jesus gave him a strong rebuke. But it got him back on track, didn't it? And sometimes... It takes a strong rebuke to get back on track. So what's our takeaway from all of this? 
confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior, like Peter, and be mindful of God's interests over all else. Confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior and be mindful of God's interests over all else. Father, in Jesus' name, we come to you today and we repent for any sins that we've committed, those that we know about and those that are unknown. Please forgive us of our sins. We confess that we are sinners and Jesus is perfect and righteous. And we thank you for the exchange that he became sin so that we could be righteous. We're so grateful that you have made us right with you and provided us for us a way to have a relationship with you and to be saved. We confess that Jesus is our Lord. We believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he died on the cross and rose again. And we confess it today. You are our Lord and Savior. Father, I ask that you would continually reveal to us your interests and that we would be mindful of your interests above all else. Thank you for all that you're doing in each and every one of our lives. And we pray that we would be better aligned with your plans and paths as we continually keep our eyes and ears open to your interests. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Protect us all. Deliver us from the evil one. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and deliver us from the evil one. Lord, let us have that atmosphere of heaven that continually surrounds us, that it would be clear and pure and that we would have this relationship and continual interaction and communication with you. We love you so much and thank you so much for today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have an awesome week and we will see you next time.